Welcome back again to the Daily Connection. Let's pray. Father, as uh, we read your word, uh, we're just astounded by this truth. And uh, now as we begin to embark upon the last chapter uh, in all of your special revelation, Father, that you've given to us, all 66 books, and we now come to the last chapter uh, that you gave uh, to John uh, for us. Would you help us to understand it? Would you help us to praise you for it? And uh, would you help us to grow in grace as we read it? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, after all this time, we now begin chapter 22 of Revelation. So let's get right into it as we continue to see eternity and the eternal state described to us. So chapter 22 of Revelation, verse 1. You ready? Here we go. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Now listen to this river. Let me know if you've ever seen a river like this. Listen to this. Bright as crystal. Bright as, no pollutants. Bright as crystal. Now listen to this. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city. So it's going to flow from the throne through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Or you could translate that, uh, Gentiles. So a river flows through the city street, and uh, there is this tree of life. Now, I would like to explain all of this to you in detail. I don't know much more than what we're reading. I've never seen this. I mean, this is just remarkable. Now, I think the idea here is that the things, uh, things are restored to where they were before the fall ruined them. Now, this trunk of this tree must be a big tree. The trunk uh, expands to both sides, extends to both sides of the river. A new fruit is produced each month. Uh, now, I should point out there, the word for healing here is a little bit different. It doesn't mean to be healed from some sort of illness or sickness. Of course, as we know, there is no illness or sickness uh, in eternity. Uh, but the idea here is more one of, of, of therapeutic and pleasure. So it has more just the, the idea of, of, of pleasure. Um, can't say a whole lot more about it uh, than that. It's just... I'm just overwhelmed as I read and see what awaits us in the future. And I think the whole point of this chapter is that we just look at it and say, wow, Lord, you are awesome. Uh, and that we say, as we'll see at the end of the chapter, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> I'm ready for all of this. We just have great expectation. Well, look now at verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed. Again, this is eternity. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. What will we be doing in eternity? Enjoying God forever and worshiping Him forever. They will see His face. Now imagine that. One day. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. Verse 5. They will need no lamp of, uh, or no light of lamp or sun, as you in sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Again, what more can be said? I mean, we're going to be there in eternity with God, and finally see face to face. What a day that's going to be! And notice, we continue to read verse six. And he said to me, "These words are trustworthy and true." I think this is God's way of saying everything in my word is true and I know what I'm saying is absolutely astounding. In fact, some people are going, to, are going to one day want to say that all this is apocryphal literature. We can't understand any of it. We don't know what it means. It's God's way of saying, no, no, I mean what I say and this is what it's going to be like. And just because you can't picture it perfectly doesn't mean it's not going to be real. It's going to be real and we're going to see it in the future. Now we continue to read, And the Lord God of the spirits of the prophets, now listen to that, of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. 
Now look, we know the prophets wrote so much of the Old Testament as they were controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the point here is that is in the same way, in the same way that the prophets wrote being controlled by the Holy Spirit, John here is recording what the angel has shown him. And of course, the book of Revelation, as I said, ties up uh, and, and fills in the gaps of much of what the Old Testament prophets uh, have to say and teach us. Verse 7, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, what does this do? This takes us all the way back to chapter 1, right? In chapter 1, we're told that the one who reads, the one who hears this, uh, these words, and the one who keeps are blessed. Now, we're blessed because we know what's going to happen in the future. Now, do we know down to every detail? Do we have dates and all that? Absolutely not. But we know what's going to happen in the future, and so we're blessed. But notice the importance of obedience. It does us no good just to know information in our minds before it to be in our hearts and for us to act out in faith. And we will be blessed. Now, continuing in verse 8. I, John, the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that I am a fellow servant with you, and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Now we can forgive John for falling down and beginning to worship this angel because he's just overcome by what he sees. But the angel's quick to correct him and say, wait a minute, no, no, no. I am a fellow servant. Uh, I am a created being just like you for the glory of God. Worship God, worship Him alone. In verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. So again, remember I said, what, what is the book of Revelation primarily? It is a book of prophecy. What is prophecy? Future events, right? Okay. So it's very, very clear uh, that this is what the book of Revelation is. So he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil. The filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Again, John is stressing the trustworthiness of this book. And as we come to the end of Revelation, we really have uh, uh, six declarations. This is the first one. But we have six declarations that are going to run us up through verse uh, 16. Verse 10 here gives us our first declaration, which is interesting because... John is told not to seal up the book. In contrast, Daniel, and remember Daniel and the book of Revelation uh, really go hand in hand. That's why in Bible colleges and seminary we often have uh, Daniel Revelation class together. Uh, but in contrast, Daniel was told to seal up his book. Right? So Daniel's told to seal up his book uh, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And then also in Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 and 9, we read Daniel's told by God, seal up the book. But, and he's actually told specifically, seal it up till the time of the end. But then remember, the book of Revelation explains much, expands much upon what Daniel had taught and actually fills in a lot of the blanks uh, from the book of Daniel. And so with the, with the book of Revelation, prophecy now can be understood and uh, there's no need to seal up the book. Now, a second declaration uh, is given in verse 11. And the point here in verse 11 is simply that the evildoer is not going to accept God's revelation. The evildoer, that is all unbelievers, they will just continue on in unbelief. However, uh, the righteous, true to their nature, will accept all of God's truth, including the truth revealed here in the book of Revelation. Well, this is exciting. We still have uh, two more to go before we finish chapter 22.